Matthew chapter 20. We've been studying the parables of Jesus together over the past few weeks. Um, this, this series is going to take us all the way almost to Christmas time. Um, so bear with us as we're walking through all the parables of Jesus. Matthew chapter 20. In 1990, the Colorado Buffaloes played the Missouri Tigers in a college football game that has famously been, become known as the fifth down game. If those of you who know anything about football, you know that you get four downs to make a first down. But in this game, in that year, 1990, was the first year that they allowed for the quarterback to spike the ball to stop the clock. And so the Colorado Buffaloes had a chance to win the game, and they were driving near the end of the, as time was running out, and they got the ball down near the goal line, and as they rushed up with under 40 seconds to go, the quarterback spiked the ball on first down to stop the clock. So they ran second down, they handed it to the tailback, and he didn't score. And so after he didn't score on the second down play, they called timeout. And so after they called timeout, a guy in the stands has a heart attack and dies. The referees and the officials and the scorekeepers and everybody's attention is kind of drawn to the EMT's workers and everything that's going on in the stands, which caused some confusion on the field which led to them forgetting about the first down spiking of the ball to stop the play or stop the clock because that's not, I hadn't been in the rules up until this point. So there was a whole lot of confusion. So what happened was second down was supposed to be now turned into third down, but they forgot to set the um, chains back to announce that it was third and they left it on second. So essentially the Colorado Buffaloes were, were awarded a fifth down. And on that fifth down, they scored as time was expiring to win the game. Why is that significant? Because the Colorado Buffaloes that year went on to share a, a portion or to share the national championship, the title for the season. And everyone has screamed from that time even till now that that game was not fair. The title of the message this morning is, That's Not Fair. Fair. Today's parable, Matthew 20, is going to show us a parable of people who worked in a vineyard. And we're going to see how God's grace is different from what we think is fair. We, you and I often think of fairness in certain terms. But today we're going to see that Jesus and God and the kingdom of God operates on grace, which is vastly different from our idea of fairness. So let me ask you this question. Have you ever said to God, this isn't fair? I, I guarantee you have. If you hadn't, keep living. <laughs> Eventually something will happen in your life. You're going to look up and say, God, this ain't fair. We've all been there at some point in time. So Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16, is the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Before we read it, what is a parable? I've, I've shared this with you every week in the study. What is a parable? It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's simply a story that everybody would understand to draw home a point of spiritual issues that everybody might not understand. It's a story drawn out of real life to drive home a point of spiritual, of spiritual nature. Why do they matter? Because they show us what God is like, what His kingdom is like, and how we are supposed to live. So let's stand together this morning as we read Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16. The parable of the workers in the vineyard. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, that's a wage a day, he sent them out into the vineyard. And when they, had about, or, and when, and they went out, out <laughs> about the third hour and saw others standing idly in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever's right, I'll give you. So they went. Again, he went out the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day long? And they said to him, Because no one's hired us. So he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever's right, you'll receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to the steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. 
And when those who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. And when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more. And they also, likewise, each received a denarius. When they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne a burden in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. If I wish to give to the last man the same as to you, is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first shall be last. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, it's my prayer this morning that you will remind us of what grace is and how it works and how it saves us. Remind us that longevity of work doesn't result in a different heaven, nor does lack of time spent serving you result in some different reward. Lord, it's my prayer this morning that you will help us to understand grace. Will you honor the reading of your word, the preaching of your word, our hearing of your word, and our obedience to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Moms and dads, how many times have you heard your kids say, this is not fair? How many times, especially if you've got multiple kids in your house, you probably heard it many times, this is not fair. How many times have we all been witness to or privy to some faithful employee of a company, someone who has given their life's service to a company, and it comes time for promotion only to be passed over for a younger employee who doesn't have the longevity built up, who doesn't have the seniority built up, and is rewarded with that promotion, we would all say, that's not fair. How many times have we seen a young person taken from their parents or killed unexpectedly, and we all say, that's not fair? How many times, listen to me, church, have you prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for God to give you something? Only to watch God not give it to you and give that same thing to somebody else that you say doesn't deserve it. And you say what to God? That's not fair. We've all been there before. If we could see things from God's point of view, we would never claim that anything that happens to us is unfair. As Christians, we have to believe that God knows what he's doing. But watch this, church. Not that God knows what he's doing but he knows what he's doing in these three words all the time. That's what we got to understand. It's not that God knows what he's doing when everything seems fair in my life, but we must understand that God knows what he's doing when what's happening to me seems to be unfair. We got to trust that God still knows what he's doing. This morning, This parable teaches us what God's kingdom is like. Matter of fact, that's what the first verse of it says. It teaches us that God's kingdom doesn't work on economic policies like we have in our world. Where if you do this, you get paid this. Where if you'll work this hard, God rewards you in this way. As a matter of fact, we as humans, especially here in our culture, we like to gauge things on scales. We like to weigh them against each other. If I work this long, I deserve this much payment. If I do this, I deserve this. But that goes directly against God's grace. God's grace doesn't work on the nature of you deserve because you have done. Actually, God's grace is the exact opposite of that. You get because you don't deserve. That's the beauty of God's grace. We like to judge things on scales, but God judges things on the cross. And there's a vast difference. Al Mohler said it this way. He said, grace cuts against our pride and is contrary to the human impulses of fairness. Let's look at the text this morning. The parable is pretty simple, actually. It's not one that has a whole bunch of background that you need to understand. It's a fairly simple parable this morning. Let's look at it. Verse 1. Verse 1 says, for the kingdom of heaven is like. So let's stop there. You know already the next 16 verses is going to show us what the kingdom of God is actually like. This is a common theme throughout the parables, that we learn what the kingdom of God is like. So let me give you just a little bit of brief background, and we'll continue on in the text. Number one, I want you to see this. The parable 
is different from our culture's idea of working. <laughs> we would not do this. We wouldn't drive to the court square at Lincoln, stand around the court square and wait on somebody to drive by to pick us up and take us to work. We wouldn't just go out to Cat Square and stand there in Cat Square and say, hey, I'm here to ready to work. Somebody drive by and pick me up and we all stick our thumb out hoping somebody gives us a job. That's not how our labor force works. What do we do? We apply. We get the proper degrees or the proper training. We apply or we get a, a lower level entry and we work our way up. That's kind of how our work system or, uh, takes place here in America. But in their culture, there was an issue with harvesting. Listen to it because this has helped you to understand the parable. They had a small window near the end of September to harvest their vineyards, to harvest the grape harvest in their vineyards. There was a small window that was followed by a rainy season in Palestine. If they don't get it harvested during this time, the rainy season destroys the crop. Why does that matter? Because there were lots of farmers and landowners that would go into the marketplace and find people that needed work, tell them to come and work. Even if it was a day or a few hours, they would go back at lunchtime, get more workers and bring them because they were in a race against the clock. As William Barclay put it, he said these farmers were in, his words, a frantic race against time. Well, you know what? We may not be in a frantic race against time with our crops, but many of you today are living in a frantic race against time. You're looking in the mirror, realizing you're getting older, and realizing I got more days behind me than I have in front of me. And you're starting to think, you know what? Maybe I need to start living in a certain way. And you're in a race against time. But the parable is going to show us the very different understanding of work. It was not uncommon in their culture for a guy to come work for an hour and go home. That's pretty uncommon in our culture, right? And there's definitely not in our culture a man who comes to work at 4 o'clock and leaves at 5 o'clock that gets paid the same as the man who come at 8 and work till 5. That's definitely not how it works in our culture. But here, this landowner says, am I not able to give away in any manner that I want? It's my stuff, and I want to be gracious with it. So we're going to look at it this morning. Number one shows us what the kingdom of heaven is like. But verse 2 shows us 6 o'clock employees. Look at verse 2. Now, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius, a denarius is just, that's the day's wage. That means one day's wage in their culture, okay? Now, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius, he sent them into his vineyard. So he went early in the morning. That's 6 o'clock. This is important. Remember this in the parable. The 6 o'clock workers agreed with the landowner for a certain wage to work for. Seems fairly simple, doesn't it, church? But it's going to change drastically. Watch what happens in verses 3, 4, and 5. And he went out the third hour. That's 9 o'clock in the morning. And saw others standing idly in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and work. Watch this. And whatever is right, I will give to you. So they went. Verse 5. And he went out again the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. Did you catch this small phrase, church? This is important in the parable. Watch. The first, the, the six o'clock employees had a contract. Remember, they had an agreement. I will work for this much money. 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and 3 o'clock employees came on, and the landowner said, go to work, and I'll give you what is right. So we got an issue on our hands here. We got all these people working on this farm, <laughs> working in this vineyard, and we got one group of people who has a contract with the landowner to pay me this much money. And then we got 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and 3 o'clock employees who just showed up late, <laughs> that they, they are working in honor to receive whatever the landowner thinks is right. Why does this matter? This is important because one group trusted a contract and the other group trusted the landowner. One group trusted that my work will result in this much money. The other group resulted in or worked for, them, for the fact that the landowner will pay me, the words of the, the parable, what is right. Look at verses 6 and 7. In the eleventh hour, that's 5 o'clock, verse 6. In the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idly and said to them, Why have you been standing here all day? Verse 7. They said, No one has hired us. He said to them, You also go to the vineyard and what is right you will receive. At first glance, it seems like maybe these 5 o'clock guys were bums. <laughs> maybe they're the vagabonds and the recluse of society. Nobody wants them to work. 
They, they didn't get picked with the first group. They didn't get picked with the 9 o'clock crowd or the 12 o'clock crowd. Or the, they must be really whittling it down to the worst workers. But actually, biblical scholars say these guys are to be more honored than the 6 o'clock workers because they were willing to wait it out all day for the opportunity to just simply work for an hour. Whereas other guys had entered into a contract, they were willing to trust a landowner to pay them even if it was just for an hour. You know why, why this is important? I believe as Christians we need to understand that we need to be like these 5 o'clock employees and we need to say, God, just give me a job. Just give me a job and I'll do it. Not just an earthly economic job, but a spiritual job as well. God, give me a role and I will do it. But we don't work that way. You know what we like to do? We like to say, God, let me figure out where I'm gifted. God, let me figure out if it fits on my calendar. God, let me see if I can get this worked in. God, let me see if there's anybody else who wants to do this job. God, let me see if anybody else can do it better than me. If they can, and I can't work it in, and it can't fit on the calendar, and I don't feel gifted, God, then let somebody else do it. Have you ever thought that maybe you just need to show up like a 5 o'clock employee and say, God, give me something to do, and I'll do it with joy? But that's not how we seem to operate in our culture anymore. But look at verse 8. The landowner paid the last guys first. Verse 8 says, So when the evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last. Now, why does this matter, church? When the 5 o'clock guys showed up to get paid at 6, the landowner gave them as much money as he gave the guys who had worked for full 12 hours. So when he paid them, the 6 o'clock guys are saying, Oh, we're about to get way more than that. And then when he paid the same amount to the 3 o'clock workers, the 12 o'clock, the 9 o'clock, and the 6 o'clock guys are all saying, oh, we about to get paid. We about to get way more money than they got, right? We worked here all day. And what happens was they started to have this feeling of entitlement, this sense of I'm about to get more because it's owed to me. I deserve more than them. Why is this significant, church? Because if we're not careful, we'll start to think, that God owes us based on what we've done. God owes us nothing. And God is in debt to no man. And God doesn't owe us because we worked hard or because we served for a long time or we went to church our whole life. God doesn't owe us anything. As a matter of fact, you've heard me say this before. If God would allow us to live one inch inside the gates of heaven, that's more than we deserve. We all deserve eternal separation from God, all of us. Verse 9 shows us the 5 o'clock employees receiving their payment. They were, were rewarded with a full day's pay. I fully understand them being mad. Yeah, uh, look at me. All you that work for a living out there, you're not retired or a student, how happy would you be with your boss if he comes to you and says, here's what I'm going to do from now on. I'm going to make you work all day, and I'm going to pay you X amount of money. But I'm going to start hiring some people at five and let them work an hour. I'm going to pay them as much as I pay you. My guess is you would either be quitting or contacting WBTV or something. You would be contacting somebody saying, this ain't right. What would you say? That's not fair, right? That's exactly what we would say. All of us would say it. And I understand you saying that. But as Christians, if we're not careful... Sometimes we'll look at God and say, God, this is not fair. But God's grace doesn't work on our ideas of fairness. Verse 10. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise each received the same, or denarius. They thought they would receive more. Why? Because they felt that their performance owed it to them. Let me talk to you just briefly about the performance trap. I don't know what else to call it except that. It's a trap that says, God, you owe me because I did this. It's a relationship that says, if I, then you. If I do, then God must do. And I want to remind you, as I said a moment ago, God is not indebted to us as if our service garners him owing us something. No, we work like the 9, the 12, the 3, and the 5 o'clock guys. Work without knowing what the reward would be or the payment will be. We just trust the landowner to do what is right. The 6 o'clock guys, the reason they were angry is because they knew they had a contract. Whereas the rest of the workers didn't have a contract. Watch. They worked because they were grateful to the landowner. 
How many of us work today because we are grateful to God? How many of us serve God because we're grateful for what he's done for us? And how many of us serve him like the six o'clock guys saying, God, you owe me because I've done X, Y, and Z. Verse 11. And when they had received it, watch this. They complained against the landowner. The six o'clock guys have complained to the landowner. If there's any sentence in this parable, if there's any sentence in the New Testament that would explain or represent us as a culture any better, I don't know what it is, but this is it. Why? Because we Christians are some seriously complaining people. You know, y'all want to be super spiritual and pretend like you're not this morning, but you know good and well that we're all complainers. All of us are. It's too hot. It's too cold. Service is too long. It's too short. He preaches too loud, not loud enough. I wish we had this deacon, that deacon, this service, this ministry, that we complain about everything. As a matter of fact, if you put Christians together in a room, it should be the most grace-filled, forgiving, encouraging room in the community, and most times it's the most argumentative place in the community. It shouldn't be, church. And what can change that? What changes that is when we start to work because we love the landowner, not because we're looking for the payment. Verse 12. It shows us the reality of equality and salvation. You know, we live in a world today where equality is a big issue, right? I mean, it's shoved down our throats at every corner. That everybody must be treated equally with equal outcomes for equal everything. Well, let me remind you of something here. Look at verse 12. The last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the whole day. God, you made them equal to us. We've done all the work. Why are they getting paid? We've done it all, and they're getting paid. I want to remind you of something very, very, easy, very easy for you to grasp this morning. There is no person any more saved than another. There's no Christian any more saved than any other Christian. You know what that means? That means for those of you out there in these pews who are struggling to follow God this morning, but you know that he has saved you and you got struggle on top of struggle and battle on top of battle. You're not any less saved than the most saved person you can think of. Well, how do we know this? Think of it like this. Before we were saved, we were all equally lost. And after we're saved, we're all equally saved. That's the beauty of salvation. It's kind of like a, a sports team who wins the title. Guess what? The MVP of the team and the, the last walk-on on the bench, they all get a ring. They all get a ring. Why? Because they're on the team. Verses 13 through 15 shows us that the six o'clock workers didn't really want other people getting what they had. Look at what it says in verse 13. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, am I doing you wrong? Am I, not, am, am I doing you wrong? Isn't this what you agreed to? <laughs> As a Christian, didn't you want God to give you heaven? And then he gives you heaven and you complain because he gives somebody else heaven too? What in the world's wrong with us? What's wrong with us as a church if we ever look out and say, God saved somebody else? Why would he do that? Why would he save you? <laughs> That's the better question. Why would he save any of us? Hell, none of us deserve it. What do we do with this parable? What in the world do we do with this parable? Look at verse 16. Jesus makes this statement that he's made in other parables. As a matter of fact, if you back up to the last chapter, you see that he made it in verse 30. Many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. That works in opposition to what we think is fair. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if a, a sports team went, or an NFL team goes 0-16, doesn't make the playoffs, doesn't win the Super Bowl, didn't win a game all year, and at the end of the year, they award them with the Lombardi Trophy. They're the champs. Well, that don't make any sense. They didn't even win a game. How in the world are they the champs? You see, grace works different than what we think of fairness. Grace works in this manner, that God rewards those who even worked last. That God rewards those who worked first. That God rewards those who worked in the middle. That God's grace is poured out on us equally. 
That God's grace to the gravest of sinner is the same as His grace to the man who sinned once or twice in his entire life. That His grace is, is given and it's needed. So what do we do with this parable? I think this parable shows us a few things this morning. I'm going to give you three and we'll wrap it up. But I want to show you a couple of qualities. First, I want you to see two qualities of God in this parable. The first one is that He's generous, and the second one is that He's compassionate. He was generous in that He paid everybody the same when He didn't have to. That means that God gave us grace when He didn't have to. That God gave me grace and you grace when He didn't have to. That God gave the man who sinned a thousand times the same grace as the man who sinned ten times. Not only was He generous, but He was compassionate. He hired the people nobody else would hire. He hired the people nobody else would hire. Look at me, church. The gospel of Jesus Christ is for the worst of sinners in our society. And it's for the best of church members in our society. And it's for everybody in between. And so today, if you ever walk in these doors and you sit in these pews and you look around and say, I wonder why he's here. I wonder why she's here. You need to ask yourself, why are you here? Why? Because God's grace is compassionate to all. He is generous and He is compassionate. But there's also two, enti- there's two issues of us in this, pa- in this parable. We see a generous God who paid them all. We see a compassionate God who hired people nobody wanted. But we also see that you and I have entitlement issues. Y'all got issues in your life? I mean, I have to go around a room and ask you. I mean, I got issues. I got issues. We got family issues, and church issues, and marriage issues, and friendship issues, and everybody got issues. We all got them. But we have entitlement issues. Now, we, especially here in the Bible Belt of the southern United States, we feel that God owes us a few things because we've been quote unquote good. The early workers here thought they deserved more. Matter of fact, it says they complained. Did you notice who they complained to? Not the other workers. They complained to the landowner. That's what you and I have a tendency to do. God, this isn't fair. But not only do we have entitlement issues, but we have complaining issues, as I've mentioned. We see here that they complained against the landowner. We Christians tend to gripe about everything. Philippians 2 tells us to do all things without complaining or grumbling. I really wish that in the New Testament that the Apostle Paul who wrote the book of Philippians in chapter 2 when he said do all things without complaining and grumbling, I really wish he would have said do some things without complaining and grumbling. Because I want to complain and grumble just like the rest of you. But we see that we have issues, entitlement issues and complaining issues. But this parable shows us very clearly God's grace on display. Three things I want you to see this morning and we'll be done. Number one, This parable teaches us three simple things. Number one, the one who comes to God late is no less valuable than the one who comes to God early. I want to tell you a story of my wife and I's testimonies, I guess for lack of a better term. So my wife went to church nine months before she was born. (laughs) She went to church in her mother's womb. Like she'd never not been to church. I didn't go to church when I was a kid. As a matter of fact, the first time my parents took me to my grandparents' Methodist church, there was a group of young men that I went to school with that walked down the aisle in in white uh, robes, and they lit the candles. They lit the candles. You know what I thought? That if you bring me back here again, I won't be one of them them dudes. Because if I got to come to church, I'm lighting something on fire. I mean, that's what I thought. I was a kid who didn't know Jesus. Well, we only went a time or two. Then we didn't go to church anymore. And then my sister gets invited to a vacation Bible school. She goes to a Bible school in, in a Wesleyan church. And, and dad goes to pick her up on Friday night at the Wesleyan church. And he feels convicted of his sin. And he, he gives his life to Christ. And they start taking us then as pre-teenagers or almost teenagers to this Wesleyan church. And I don't have a clue what's going on because I ain't been to church. I don't know what's going on. I am as clueless as clueless can be. So finally, as a senior in high school, I give my life to Jesus because a friend of mine explained the gospel to me just a few weeks from graduation. 
He explains the whole gospel to me. It walks me through that God saves me by His grace. That Jesus' death on the cross was done so that I could receive God's grace. And my wife says, you know, I, I kind of wish I had a testimony that looked like yours. And she said to me many times, I wish I had a testimony that was a little more dynamic like yours. To which I have said to her, I wish I had yours. Because I wouldn't want you to have to go through some of the stuff I went through. I wouldn't want you to have to go to bed at night wondering if you're really going to go to heaven or hell, if there is an afterlife. I wouldn't want you to worry about those things. And even as a young child, she gave her life to Christ. I didn't until I was on, I'm well, almost 18 years old or 18 years old. But my wife isn't more valuable to God than me because she came early and I came later. And this morning, you may be sitting in these pews saying, Pastor, I'm 45 years old. I can't give my life to Jesus. The whole church will look at me like I'm crazy. It's better late than never. And if you come late, guess what? You get the same heaven that those who came early. If you come late, you get the same grace as those who came early. As a matter of fact, this morning, maybe you're a child and you get an opportunity this morning to come early. Come. Come now and spare yourself some of the heartache that those who come late went through. The one who comes early to God, or the one who comes late to God, is no less valuable than the one who come early. Now let me put it to you. Let me give you another example. Mom and daddies, especially if you are mom and daddy of multiple kids or more than one kid, let me ask you a very simple question: Do you love your youngest child more than your oldest child? Youngest children don't answer that question. <laughs> Do you love your middle child more, less than your youngest child? Do you love your oldest child more than your young? No. That's crazy. As a matter of fact, every mama and daddy in this room would gladly lay down their life for all their kids. If you have multiple kids for every one of them, they wouldn't, I wouldn't look at the oldest one and go, I will give my life for that one. Look at the middle one and go, eh. Look at the last one and go, no, none of you mamas and daddies would do that, would you? Now, there might be times where you feel like that. <laughs> Why? Because you love the eldest just like the youngest. And those who come to God late are no less valuable than those who come early. Those who worked 5 o'clock to 6, they're not less valuable to God than those who work from 6 to 6. Number two, God's grace is different from our ideas of fairness. I know I've said that a few times in this passage. But God's grace is different from our ideas of fairness. Our ideas of fairness says that he who works the hardest gets the most. Our idea of fairness says that he who works the least should get the, less, uh, the least. Our ideas of fairness says that those who walk the middle ground should get middle payment for it. That's our idea of fairness, but God's grace works different from that. As a matter of fact, let's put it in, into perspective. Remember when Jesus was hanging on the cross? And there was a thief hanging beside him. And the thief looked at him mere moments before his death and said, Jesus, will you remember me when you go into your kingdom? And he had mere moments before he would die. He didn't have a life to serve Christ with. He had a few minutes to then proclaim boldly, I'm going to the paradise with this guy. And that was all he had. You know what fairness in our culture says? Fairness to us says, Billy Graham the Apostle Paul, Peter, Calvin, Luther, all the church saints, they should get the city of heaven. But that thief on the cross should get the far corner of heaven. That's what fairness says. Fairness says the guy who has served God faithfully for many years should get a better heaven than the one who served him for a few. But God's grace works different from our ideas of fairness. When we cry, it's not fair, we must understand that God doesn't work the way you and I would. That the thief on the cross gets the same heaven as all the rest of us. That you who are struggling today, but you're trusting Christ in your struggles, you get the same heaven as he who has walked faithfully with God for many years. We cry out, it's not fair when a child is taken from their parents. We cry out, it's not fair when mom dies from a disease. We cry out, it's not fair when the company downsizes me. It's not fair. How many times, church, how many times have you ever heard yourself say or anyone else say, it really wasn't fair that Jesus died for me? Because what we like to do is say, God, I did this, you owe me this. 
God, I served here. Give me this. God, why are you punishing me when I've done good for you? And what we forget is that Jesus' death on the cross so we could have life wasn't fair, but God did it because He's gracious to us. Let me give it to you in a tweetable (laughs) or Instagram post. It wasn't fair that the flawless Son of God gets death so that flawed people like us get life. That wasn't fair. But none of us seem to be griping about that, do we? None of us seem to be screaming that when God treats us what we consider unfairly because things didn't go the way we wanted them to. We seem to say, God, that's not fair. But none of us have ever said, God, thank you for not being fair. Because if you were fair, I would not get heaven. God's grace is different from our ideas of fairness. God doesn't make mistakes. He knows what he's doing. And number three and last, God has a tendency of giving believers more than they deserve. If you read this parable closely, you understand that those who worked a little got paid a lot. And those who worked in the middle, they too got paid a lot. And that those who worked a lot, they got paid a lot. And this this shows us that the five o'clock employees didn't deserve a full day's pay but God gave it to them anyway. That the three o'clock employees didn't deserve a full day's pay, but he gave it to them anyway. The 12 o'clock and the nine o'clock didn't deserve a full day's pay, but they got it anyway. And none of us in this room deserve heaven, but thankfully, thankfully, God is a gracious God who gives us all way more than we deserve. This morning as we wrap this up, The workers in the vineyard were were rewarded by the owner because of his goodness, not because of their efforts. He paid them because he was gracious, not because they worked hard. He paid them because he was a good landowner. And you need to understand this morning that God is good even when we think he's bad, even when we think he's unfair, even when we're tempted to point our finger and shake our fist at him, he is still good. As I said at the beginning, I'll say in conclusion, if we could see the world from God's perspective, we would not utter the words, that's not fair. As a matter of fact, when we get to heaven, none of us will ever look out over heaven and say, God, this isn't fair. We will look out and say, God, Thank you that I didn't understand grace. Thank you that all the times I told you this wasn't fair. Thank you that you were gracious instead. Fairness is when the Son of God, or I should say it's not fair for the Son of God to get death so we can get life. The flawless Son of God gets death so that flawed people like us could get life. This morning, church, I know you're tempted to say life's not fair. And the truth is, sometimes it's not. But grace goes against our ideas of fairness. Let's stand together this morning. Brother Joel, you want to go get the kids for us? Mom and Dad, if you have a child at Children's Church, we'll bring those kids back into the sanctuary for you. So at the conclusion of my prayer, if you want to wait, your kid will be brought back in here to you. For the rest of you this morning, for those of you who have been walking with God a long time, let me say press on and don't give up. For those of you who just started walking with God not too long ago, press on and keep working. But for those of you who may be sitting here today saying, God, you've not been fair to me, I want to remind you, the flawless Son of God getting death so flawed you and I could get life, that is grace. That is the ultimate picture of grace. Let's pray together this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you from Mount Vernon Baptist Church. And God, as we wrap this up this morning and as we continue our study through the parables, I pray that you help us to understand what your kingdom is like, how we are supposed to live, and what it's like from your perspective. God, help us this morning, for those of us in this room who are working hard for you, to press on. And God, help us to love the landowner more than the payment. In Jesus' name, amen.